each needle holder grip has specific mechanical advantages and disadvantages which dictate its use in a given surgical situation. For the most part, and in most small animal surgery situations, you will use the thumb and ring finger grip. This grip's best asset is that it allows precision in releasing the needle, since the thumb actually releases the lock on the instrument. In the Thenar grip, pressure by the heel of the hand releases the lock, which is faster but less controlled. The last two grips serve totally different needs. The palmed grip is used when driving force is needed to place a needle through dense scar tissue, fascia, cartilage, or thick skin. The pencil grip is the most delicate and accurate method of suturing. This grip is best used with the Castroviejo needle holders, and the needle can be advanced through the tissues only by rotating the holder between the index finger and thumb. Thumb or tissue forceps are grasping instruments that are used to assist instrument maneuvers of the opposite hand which may be holding a scalpel, scissors, clamp, or a needle holder. Thumb forceps are usually held with a modified pencil grip. With this grip, the shanks of the forceps are resting against the index finger's metacarpal phalangeal joint. Then each blade of the forcep can be used as an extension of the finger it rests against. This gives the best mobility for assisting in tissue handling. There is a natural tendency to use the palm grip when first practicing operative technique. However, there is little use for this grip since the tips of the forceps can only gain access to a wound by extreme flexion of the wrist, thereby limiting the useful motion of the forceps. When the forceps are not in use, they can be supported in the palm of the hand and held with the extended ring and little fingers. This leaves the other three fingers for other duties, such as knot tying. When placing a stitch, you should hold both elbows wide and approach the wound from opposite sides with your two hands. This allows maximum maneuverability with both hands and arms without feeling cramped or awkward. For the most part, the tissue that the needle will immediately enter should be grasped with the forceps first. If the tissue is grasped well away from the point of needle entrance, you have lost the fine maneuverability of the forceps. Hold the tissue comfortably close to the desired needle entrance point, but not at the point so that the needle is blocked. Once the needle has penetrated the tissue, then the forceps can be released and used to retract tissue to expose the needle exit, if needed. And now the steps in placing a forehand stitch. First, the needle should be grasped perpendicular to the needle holder so that it is driven through the tissue by rotating the holder on its long axis. Grasping the needle near its eye or swag works best for most soft tissue procedures. It allows maximum exposure of the needle point for re-grasping, but is more likely to bend or break the needle if the surgeon drives it forcibly through tissue. Second, the proper needle holder grip is used depending on the situation. For practice on the foam board and for most small animal procedures, use the thumb ring finger grip. Third, try to position the free end of the suture strand opposite the direction you are suturing. For the forehand stitch, the end should be directed away from the surgeon or in the direction of your assistant. This reduces the potential for tangling and will force your partner, if you have one, to assist you. Fourth, make a mental note to put the needle in the correct position on the first attempt. Start the forehand stitch with the hand in some pronation so that it is comfortable to drive the needle through the tissue with supination or rotation of the wrist. Step five is inserting the needle through the tissue. Often, the manner of 
needle insertion has been described as following the curve of the needle. The idea of this is that the manner of tissue penetration with a needle is both a driving and a rotating motion. If the needle is advanced as a stab with purely driving force and no rotation, the swag or eye of the needle will tend to lacerate tissue. In addition, the needle chosen should allow the needle to be advanced through both sides of the wound with enough point exposed for easy extraction. Remember that steady, moderate pressure rather than quick force on the needle will penetrate tough tissue much better without risking breakage. 6. Release of the needle is, for most students, the most difficult step in placing a stitch. Releasing the needle without undue stress on tissue is considered by seasoned surgeons as the most critical step in placing a stitch. To achieve this, tissue forceps can be used to grasp the point of the needle to prevent the needle from retracting into the tissue, or the needle can be stabilized by holding the surrounding tissue with the thumb forceps. Perhaps the most important practice for smooth needle release is practice in releasing the lock on the needle holders smoothly. Step 7 is re-grasping the needle for extraction. You should try to grasp the needle again perpendicular to the holder to ease the extraction of the needle with a rotating motion. If thumb forceps are used to extract the needle, the same rule holds true. You will find that smooth thumb forceps or brown adsens help better with needle extraction than a rat tooth forcep like the adsen. When placing a continuous pattern, the needle should be extracted and placed in the desired holder position, preferably without using the fingers. In step 8, the same forces for needle insertion into tissue are required for atraumatic needle extraction. Proper removal requires extraction force in the same direction as the driving force and rotation. The supinated grasp of the needle saves time if the needle can be grasped in the center. This allows the next stitch to be taken without readjusting the needle. In step 9, the surgeon pulls the stitch by the needle in the holder with one uninterrupted motion until the established amount of tension is placed on the tissue. The excess suture can be handed to the assistant or placed on the opposite side of the wound to prevent tangling. In step 10, if the needle was not previously placed in the correct holder position for the next stitch of a continuous suture line, it is done now. This starts the process over at step 1. You may find it difficult to control long suture ends when tying knots. When an interrupted suture is placed after the needle is extracted, the needle is grasped by the thumb and index fingers and the remaining suture is pulled and gathered into the available fingers until a workable amount is achieved. On a continuous line, if an assistant is available, once the needle has been extracted, the suture is handed over to the assistant to pull the suture through to the desired length or tension so that the surgeon is ready for the next stitch. Another problem is that of ending a continuous suture pattern. With a swedged on needle, as you near the end of the wound, the suture strand directly trailing the needle can be tied to the last loop in the continuous suture line. A more cosmetic technique is to end the swedged on needle suture line as follows. Once the last stitch closes the wound, the needle is reversed and inserted close to the needle exit site, directly opposite the last needle passage, and the knot is tied from the needle strand to the remaining narrow loop as described above. This technique reduces tissue bunching, seen especially when a continuous line with large gaps between tissue bites is tied at the end. With an eyed needle, as the end of the wound is approached, the double strand of suture 
which is looped through the needle eye, is taken directly through the final stitch and is tied to the free end of the double strand that is not pulled through the incision. If the remaining end of a continuous line is short and a hand tie is preferred, an additional strand of suture may be passed through the last loop and used as a tether to tie a flat, secure knot.